So greetings, everyone. I am really delighted today to be in a conversation with my friend and colleague, Martha Hines. And let me give a brief bio of Martha, and I'll have her more complete bio below the video. And then we're going to get into a conversation about some of the newly discovered objects in space that are really supporting our expansion of consciousness. Um, but Martha Alter Hines is an astrologer, healer, author, and mother. She has 20 years of experience as a clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and body worker, and has also channeled a series of books called Living the One Light series. She is dedicated to serving our world, to helping us to thrive, and to supporting us to come back into the infinite wisdom and healing that is our natural state of being. And I just have so much respect for you, Martha, and for the profound integration of spiritual work, healing work, and astrological work that you do. But tell us a little bit about your work, and then we'll get into our conversation together. Yeah, well, I want to start by saying how much I respect you and um and as you know and as anyone who knows me well knows I don't tend to to be a follower <laughs> I have a lot of Aries Uranus and Aries Zena very strongly in my chart and so I I need to do it my way right but if if there were anyone in the world I considered a mentor at this point, it would absolutely be you. Mm. So um, yeah, you're just, I think everyone would agree that among many other qualities, you have incredible integrity, compassion, groundedness, um, so many things that I admire and mm. appreciate. And I know thousands and thousands of other people do also. So thank wow. you for being all of those things. Thank you, Martha. And I see those qualities in you as well. <laughs> but yes, tell us some about how you do your unique synthesis. Yeah, my own way. Um, <clears throat> well, like you said, I I do have this background in clinical social work. And so I, ha I come with a really, mm, a passion for social justice and being very grounded and rooted in a trauma-informed approach to everything I do, including astrology. And then specifically with astrology, um, the primary person I have studied with is Ari Moshe Wolf, who I also love and is a good friend and I highly recommend. So having studied with him, I am pretty deeply rooted also in the Jeffrey Wolf Green version of evolutionary astrology. But in the past year to a year and a half, um, I mean, I've been studying with you. And also I've been ex getting being really drawn and called to more and more deeply integrate my own connection with the spirit world which is then calling me into, I think, what we're going to talk about today, which is these the reality that our, our consciousness and our existence is so much, is so vast and so far beyond, you know, the main planets that we think of in astrology. And so the ultimate calling or the ultimate goal of everything that I do in my work is really is really steeped in what the spirit world says to me that we are midwifing ourselves back into a remembering of who we are. Um, so when I approach astrology or when I approach anything, it is crucial to me that it all is in service of healing and that it all is in service of this ultimate remembering of our full consciousness. And again, in a grounded trauma informed compassionate way um and there's you know there's many many other layers there but i think that's the gist <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That is just so beautiful. And I think that's what we both have in common is that theme of the importance of healing in order to come back into our wholeness and in order to move into that higher consciousness. And, you know, we're going to be talking today about some of these ways in which our consciousness is expanding with the discovery of the Kuiper Belt objects, Sedna, who ventures out to the Oort cloud, the centaurs. But it feels like, you know, part of the context of this is that we are in this larger cycle of ending one processional cycle, beginning a new one, moving into the age of Aquarius, but also coming to the end of the 5,000-year Kali Yuga, which is the time of forgetting. Mm -hmm. And so this whole theme that you're talking about in terms of our remembering who we truly are, I think is a critical part of our healing and coming into more of a sense of our wholeness as humanity in order to move into this higher consciousness. But say some about how these Kuiper Belt objects are, from your perspective, guiding us in that process. Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, the Kuiper Belt objects are relatively new to me, as I think they are for most people. <laughs> and so so for me, it's still, a, a, I'm diving in and I'm learning and I'm and I'm really trying to feel them and listen to them. So anything I say in this moment could be very different next week. <laughs> so that's my caveat. But but what I feel when I do tune into them is um, actually, interestingly, I get more called to the Oort cloud than to the Kuiper belt. But the Kuiper belt feels like a beautiful step toward the Oort cloud and toward even beyond the Oort cloud, really, actually. Um, so specifically with the Kuiper belt, I feel, you know, the way, and there's so many layers here that I'm sure you, I would love to hear your perspective on also. Because so many of them are named after creator gods and um, a lot of them are named after beings that are of indigenous his, you know, have an indigenous history to them and an indigenous um, a connection to an indigenous culture of some kind, and 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 I absolutely love the Manwe Varda couple who are from a Tolkien novel that is just phenomenal, right? So there's there's certain certain names that are coming actually even from modern current culture, and so. There's just many, many, many ways in which I feel this whole set of the Kuiper belt as helping us to transform into the reality that we are, number one, expand. We are we are expanded so far beyond what we think of as our inner, more close-in solar system, number one. Number two, we are creator beings. We are those energies that are the life force of source itself, which I feel mirrored in a lot of the archetypes of the Kuiper belt objects. Um, and most of all, I feel, yeah, I just feel them, them holding this space for us to, to remember who we are, to midwife ourselves back into this bigger, larger context of our whole being and our whole consciousness. Um, and again, I could go on and on, but I would love to hear your thoughts too. That's great. And, and there's such a theme in your work, Martha, around coming back into oneness, coming back into connection with source. So it makes sense to me that you're really drawn to the Oort cloud, which really is the source of all of the material that birthed our solar system. And I think the Oort cloud is reminding us of coming back into that connection with the sea of cosmic consciousness, our oneness. But you and I were talking before we got on um, to about the layers of our solar system, that we have the inner solar system, which is basically this flat plane of planets orbiting the sun. 
between Mars and Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt, which may be the remains of an exploded planet, but I think it is helping us reclaim the lost parts of ourselves and be tuning into that healing process that we need to be in. And in particular, the asteroid belt reminds us of our connection to the sacred feminine mm-hmm. and those lost aspects of ourself, selves, especially in the last 5,000 years of patriarchy. But then we venture further out and particularly, you know, between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus are Chiron and Chericho, the centaurs, half horse, half human, reminding us to connect more with the natural world and guiding us in our healing journey. They're shapeshifters. Then we move further out to the Kuiper Belt, which is this donut-shaped Taurus structure, the structure of energy, and reminding us of these energies from source. And then we move further out to the sphere of the Oort cloud. So we go from this kind of two-dimensional, if you if you want to think about it that way, reality in the inner solar system to this increasing expansion and multi-dimensional reality of our expanding consciousness, which I think, as you're saying, is what we're called back into in this time, but we can't get there without doing the healing work to support us in that expansion and that remembrance. Yeah. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this because this has just been dawning on me in the last week or two. I think it first came to me in a class I had with you on Pluto. And then it came to me again in a talk I gave on Erisina a few days ago. And so you've heard me say this already, but I would love your thoughts more and more and more. Even as you're talking right now, what I'm feeling is there's this whole reality that Pluto used to be a planet. Then it got quote unquote demoted to a dwarf planet. And when I feel, and it, and, and it, it is now named as the first discovered Kuiper belt object, right? So the more and more I feel into the energetic of that Kuiper belt and then beyond the Kuiper belt to the Oort cloud, it feels to me like energetically, like maybe Pluto is almost like, like a gateway, like a transformative force that allows us to move into the consciousness, transform ourselves into the consciousness that the Kuiper belt holds. And then I'm feeling almost in a way like the Kuiper belt itself is a transformative energetic that then helps us to expand to the Oort cloud. And then the, and then, and then the reality is that actually existence exists far, 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 far beyond the Oort cloud through infinity. Right. (laughs) So there's so many layers there, but I'm, I'm wondering if you, what you think about that idea of Pluto being this actually like a gateway into all of this. And then the Kuiper belt, maybe even being another gateway into something even bigger. Do you have any thoughts on that? I love that. Cause when I, I heard you talking about that in the class and in your Eris Zena talk, you were basically saying Pluto wasn't being demoted in a way Pluto's being elevated. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe. <laughs> But I think what you're saying that is so profound is it is the planet of transformation. It Mm -hmm. is that alchemical energy guiding us through this process of metamorphosis. And so I think you're really onto something that it is that gateway into that deeper consciousness as well as higher consciousness about who we truly are. And it is really walking that boundary between our solar system and the Kuiper belt that's guiding us into that larger consciousness and remembrance of our true nature. So I think that, and it was demoted as a planet when it was in alignment with the galactic center. That it, I didn't realize that. Oh, wow. So truly in it, the height of its power <laughs> 
So I think I think what you're saying energetically makes a lot of sense. Mm. That's amazing. And then and then Varda currently is I if I'm remembering correctly is currently in conjunct the galactic center. Um the other thing that really I think is is powerful in what you're saying about Pluto is that Pluto is that you know first discovered Kuiper belt object and I th- and it is guiding us out of our paradigm of the solar system into that understanding of the Taurus shape mm. of the Kuiper belt and we have that toroidal energy around our own bodies that's the shape of our energy field which is about energy coming from spirit into matter and then ascending from matter back into spirit so i think the kuiper belt is reminding us of that whole process of life death rebirth transformation that pluto then brings that wisdom into our solar system Wow. Okay. I would love your thoughts on this also, because one of the other things I feel so strongly called to in my own work, in my own life, um, and I feel this calling just in the world in general, is my sense of part of what is going on right this moment as we're, you know, moving into this, whatever words you want to put on it quote unquote, new earth or the age of Aquarius or any, however you want to label it. Certainly this, there's a wave of something new. And in that something new, one of the key components that is a major theme in my own life and my own work is this remembering this conscious, this way of being consciously aware of ourselves both as earth Mm -hmm. and as infinity at the same time and coming back into a way of being that I think many of us and probably most people listening to this video this would be true for I think is I I feel strongly that most of us have had many 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 lifetimes on this planet other places where we our way of knowing and our way of um, accessing information, if you want to call it that, has been through our whole being, which I also feel mirrored in a lot of the Kuiper Belt um, archetypes. And and so you talk in your work a lot about you know integrating the left and right hemispheres of the brain which certainly seems related to this. And for me also, it's really about not only integrating the brain, it's actually about integrating the whole, the whole being that we are so that we can, we can remember our own personal unique ways of being these um, conduits of cosmic knowledge that I think that's our natural way of being. And that we each have a unique way we're meant to do that so that so that we can bring through this this new way of being and the solutions that our world needs and whatever it all is um, that can only come through each of us individually, like as those, you know, the puzzle pieces that we need all of them. (laughs) But it. What you're saying, I think, is so important because, and I one of the gifts in your work is how much you stress the importance of our being grounded and in our embodiment. You know, I think there is a tendency in some spiritual circles for that spiritual bypass, you know, that we're moving into a fifth dimensional reality and we can just rise above this the chaos of this dimension and not stay connected to our embodiment or to the earth. So I think what you're talking about is very much about the importance of that integration of earth and sky embodiment and our spiritual sense of connection with infinity. 
but you're also really describing the important theme of the Aquarian age, that we are all interconnected. We are all a part of this larger oneness, but we each are here to be a creative expression of our own unique identity and that only we can live that and express that. So I think you really tap in very in a very deep intuitive way to that undercurrent of the Aquarian age and how we can live that and embody that. Yeah, and that and I and again I I feel so strongly that there are there are ways of knowing that we've forgotten again the Kali Yuga I think you know that that we've I can speak for myself, but I think it's true for a lot of us that we've been encouraged to do the academic left brain, rational thinking, logical, analytical thinking, which is wonderful. I fully support it. And um, I know in my own life that that is about a tenth at the most of (laughs) what actually needs to move through me into the world. And and the space I need, I'm meant to hold in the world is it's not really my rational brain that's doing most of that work. Um, it plays a, a huge role, abs- no doubt. But then there's this all, like if we were each able to come online in our full, full ability to, to be the, the consciousness of infinity. I mean, first of all, we need to do that in a really grounded trauma-informed way (laughs) and there's many layers to what that means um but assuming you know we were able to do that uh, i i can't even imagine what the world would be like (laughs) i can just feel this wave that would just sweep through um yeah to be able to know things through our whole being our whole body instead of trying to only rationally come up with answers Well, I think, you know, my, again, because I'm interested in these larger cycles of our human evolution, we were in ancient times, primarily right brain dominant. Mm -hmm. And I think we had these telepathic abilities, the capacity to attune to and communicate with the life forms around us, as well as with the energies of the cosmos and of source. But then about 5,000 years ago, we really shifted into more left brain dominance with the development of written language. And now we've really been exploring the full extent of being left brain dominant, which has, has brought us certain gifts, but also has increased a sense of separation. And so I do believe that the Aquarian age is calling us back into rebalancing the left brain, right brain, so that we have, as you're saying, that capacity to honor our own individual expression while remembering our interconnectedness and our oneness and and opening up some of those ways of communing with the cosmos and being in connection with the life around us that we have gotten disconnected from. Yeah. Yeah. And I have one other thing arising, and I would—I'm asking you the questions here. I'm in interviewing mode, <laughs> 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 but this is another thing that's coming up for me: is that um, I got an email yesterday from someone asking a question that I've heard from many people over time. Very legitimate question, which is: um, this person was. I do do a lot of work with asteroids. I do a lot of work with goddesses and I do a lot of work with, obviously I'm obsessed currently with the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud and all of that. So this person was saying, um, she's very familiar with, with evolutionary astrologer, uh, astrology. And she's been talking to some astrologers who say that it is just too overwhelming and too much data to try to incorporate anything beyond the main nine planets in other words don't don't try to bother with asteroids don't try to it's just too much um and and what she was saying is but then i'm confused because i notice that when i'm looking at a particular chart maybe uh you know an asteroid will be squaring the nodes of the moon 
which is very significant in, in evolutionary astrology. To have anything squaring the nodes of the moon is a huge deal, <laughs> right? And 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 she, this person clearly knows evolutionary astrology really well, and she's pointing out that, um, long story short, essentially the south node, because of the way that the asteroid is placed, if you're looking at the nodes in the evolutionary astrology way, in this particular case, you would need to look to the south node to really know kind of where to focus. Okay. Um, and so she's saying, so now that's really confusing because if I'm not supposed to look at the asteroids, I would want to integrate more through the north node. But if I do look at the asteroid, then I would want to integrate more through the south node. So this is a big deal. What do I do? <laughs> you know? Um, and I have my own answers to that, but which I'm guessing are similar to yours, but I would love your, your thoughts. Uh but I would love to hear what you think about that. And then I'll share my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, on a basic level, I think that the, the cosmos includes so much more than the nine typical planets we look at in astrology. And I honestly feel really sad. I feel really, I feel grief. That's what I feel when I think of not being told not to look at asteroids or anything beyond the nine. I feel like it's a suppression of, like you're saying, the feminine. It's a, a suppression of even parts of the masculine. Like Eros is an asteroid I look at. I've been called to very strongly recently. <clears throat> um, and so many more, you know, feminine, masculine, um, non-binary, all of the above. And so I feel like it's missing parts of who we are to not look at them. It, it takes on a completely different picture when we do. and. Yeah, even again, getting into the Kuiper belt, you know, we have Pluto in this dance with um, with Haumea right now, and Pluto in a dance with, even with Sedna, and um, that's it, just, it's a completely, for me, I feel like we're not feeling into all of what our soul might be calling to us. And, and so I would say to somebody, you know, if your soul isn't calling you to this thing, don't try to get every single data point that's going to be overwhelming but if your soul is calling to you to incorporate something then i would listen to your soul <laughs> that's what i would do well i mean part of what i really respect about your astrological work is how strongly you trust your guidance from spirit how you work in a very intuitive way and and for me being in uh, in astrological reading with someone is having a soul level conversation. And before every reading, I open up to that connection with spirit and ask that we be in the conversation that we need to be in. And to me, I think it then allows us to be guided to look at what are the critical themes in the chart that need to be addressed in this moment with this person in their own evolutionary process. So to say only use these nine planets or look at this and not this is a very left brain, again, authoritarian, constricting way of working with the process rather than a deeper, more intuitive right brain relational way of being in the process. But I also think, and this is one of the things that I, I love as I've worked with astrology over the years, I feel like the universe and spirit guide us in a reading to see the core themes that the person is working in this lifetime that come through in many different ways in the chart. So those patterns, and again, that's the kind of right brain intuitive perspective, those patterns may come through in configurations with asteroids or planets or Kuiper belt objects, but it's the theme that's important. Yes. Rather than getting too caught up in the details. Yes, completely agree. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another issue I'd love to explore with you is I mean, you in your own background have lived in different parts of the world, have really had quite an exposure to very different cultures. And 
one of the things that I think is beautiful about the Kuiper Belt objects is they're reminding us of that cultural diversity. You know, so many of the planets have been shaped by our projection of Greek and Roman mythology onto them. But the Kuiper Belt objects are reminding us of creation gods and goddesses from ancient Hawaiian cultures, from the Easter Island, from, you know, different Native American indigenous cultures. And to talk about your experience with that and how you think that's important in what we're integrating astrologically as well. Yeah, I have probably multi-layered feelings about it. I I do get nervous, of course, about the cultural ap- appropriation part. And, and and I wouldn't I would not want us to continue to name things after Greek and Roman myths. That feels um uh ethnocentric. <laughs> So it's this tricky balance of both not being ethnocentric and not doing cultural appropriation at the same time. And that's hard. (laughs) Um, But yes, I, when I, one way in which I would say I'm moving, I don't, I don't want to say I'm moving away from evolutionary astrology. It's more that I feel like I'm expanding, building on what I, the, the deep rootedness I do have in evolution, evolutionary astrology. One of the ways I feel like I'm expanding is partially through studying with you and also just um, my own soul calling to really have a direct relationship with the planets or the asteroids or the, the celestial beings themselves. And so one thing that has happened for me as I've begun to do that is had these epiphanies that are so obvious, but for example, <clears throat> one epiphany I had, again, super obvious, those celestial beings, the planets all existed before humans, <laughs> right? So... <laughs> Good insight. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really amazing. Um, no, but it's true. And so, so we get caught up in Saturn being Saturn, for example. Well, the planet, the being that is a celestial physical uh, presence existed far beyond, I mean, far before the story of Saturn ever could have been thought of by a human because humans didn't even exist. So to me, that's, that's the number one priority in my own relationship to the planets and beyond is is to try to have as much as possible my own relationship to the actual being that is each of these things and then if we're gonna then label them absolutely i feel that we need to be doing it from you know as much variety as much diversity as possible and also to hold it lightly and hold it carefully and consciously um, and have honor and respect for if we happen to choose names from certain cultures to hold that with honor and respect as much as we possibly can. Um, Yeah, and have humility and recognize that we could be wrong, we could be making a mistake, we could be doing this in a way that doesn't feel good to the people of that actual culture. I don't know. Uh, Just be in a very um, not knowing place, I guess, as it's done. That feels important to me. What about you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm really respecting the, the cultural context. Yes. Well, I think part of what you're saying that, you know, we certainly share that perspective and, you know, in, in the, class we've been in together, a lot of what we've been doing is doing shamanic journeys to the planets to honor their own consciousness and to connect with their energies and allow them to share with us their archetypal meaning and their energies. And I do believe, and you talk about this in some of your recent YouTube videos, that we have to really be conscious of our 
archetypal understanding of the planets and be aware of what we may be projecting onto them. Because I feel very strongly that we have so many of our understandings of the planets that are shaped by Greek and Roman mythology are coming out of the age of Aries and a patriarchal lens and perspective. And that part of Pluto and Capricorn is deconstructing those social structures and ways of understanding that have gotten out of balance so that we can heal and come back into right harmony, right relationship with each other, with the earth, with the cosmos. So I think we have to deconstruct some of those stories and projections that we've put onto the planets. And you talk a lot about that in one of your recent videos, the importance of looking at our stories about these planets and how much of that is a reflection of us or aspects of our own history versus the deeper meaning of these planets. And what did they have to tell us to guide us in our journey of healing and transformation? So I think that we do have to be very, as you're saying, conscious of what we are projecting onto these planets versus how they may be informing us about their energy and their meaning. And I think part of that can come from, I, I love the whole concept of the doctrine of signatures and that plants, planets will give us a sense of their energy and their meaning by their orbits, how they move, what their composition is, how they interact with other planets. So I think, again, it's moving into a more of a right brain relational orientation with the planets to be tuning into what they have to tell us rather than projecting our own ideas and meaning onto them. Right. And actually, even it, I feel like it, part of that process actually also incorporates incorporates some of the left brain understanding some of the astronomy as we under you know feel into the astrology so for example i think it was in your class when we were focusing on uranus uranus has an orbit that is um perpendicular to the to the direction of the orbits of the other planets is that am i getting that right yes <laughs> it, its axis is tilted so that it's not orbiting vertically it's orbiting horizontally which is fascinating, right? I mean, that blows my mind because of course we think of Uranus as what kind of Uranian energy, if you can say does its own thing, I would say more like it's, it helps us to align with the intelligence of the divine, but, but I love that it's sort of lying, you know, it's doing, it's literally doing its own thing. <laughs> it's, it's so awesome. And then, and then when we look at um, the orbits of the Kuiper belt objects and the, the literal physical orbit of, let's say Sedna. And we see, you know, how they are tilted compared to the plane of the orbits of the main planets. I mean, to, to literally take our consciousness into what it is to be in a, in an orbit that is tilted and elliptical, both if we go into that full body, full being way of experiencing it, not just even through our brain, but through our whole being, um, having a combination of both the, the astronomical knowledge of what it actually exists, coupled with our, our approach that is our, in our full consciousness, those together to me feel like such a powerful and needed way to truly feel what these beings are and who we are because we are them. Um, mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Which is so well said. I mean, it is that hermetical understanding that as above, so below, as it is outside of us, so it is within us, as it is within us, so it is outside of us. Mm. So, and, and talk a little bit about your upcoming summit 
which is why you're doing all these interviews, yeah. <laughs> because that's such a theme in your work is re-becoming the one. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So one of one of the things, one of my big projects right now is this symposium called Rebecoming the One. And a year ago, I held the first version of Rebecoming the One, which you were a huge part of and incredibly supportive of, and I'm still so grateful. Um, but the purpose of Rebecoming the One on the surface is that it is it's intended to be um, a way to collectively address the healing of our relationships to gender and sexuality. And, but really on a bigger level, healing our relationship to gender and sexuality for me is one of infinite kind of gateways into this ultimate healing of returning to our consciousness of, as source. And so this symposium came to me literally in a, on my birthday in 2022, <laughs> um, I felt a bolt of lightning go through my body and this vision of the symposium just flashed in front of my eyes and I was told, do it. <laughs> so, so I did. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And um, I reached out, for example, to you and you said, yes, I'll be a part of it. And then 41 other people did too. And so that last year there were 42 speakers. I'd say about 40 to 50% were astrologers <clears throat> and people loved it. And people of all walks of life loved it. And I had a huge amount of feedback that um, this changed my life. I didn't think this was something I needed. And yet now I'm 75 years old and I realize I have so much to learn and so many ways I still want to grow. And thank you so much for doing this, you know, on and on and on many, 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 many different ways that seem to affect people. So this year I was told by the spirit world again to hold it again, but, but, um, in a slightly different way. So the feedback I received was that people loved it, but <clears throat> they want less, in a sense, less content, but more time to integrate it. So I would say one way I would characterize this is that, you know, there are many summits out there and I would, I mean, you could call this a summit, but I would call it more of like a collective healing space conference almost so what words would i put to this right my intention with it is absolutely genuinely to be a place and a space for us to collectively come into healing of our relationship to gender and sexuality but really truly healing ourselves and healing our world together um and so this year it's Last year, it was an eight-day event. This year, it's an entire month. <laughs> and um, instead of 42 speakers this year, I think it's now... I was aiming for 20 to 25, but it is currently about 30. So I tried to make it smaller, but there's so many amazing people who want to be part of it. How, I can't say no. It's impossible. So, so yeah. So again, I'd say about 40 to 50% of the speakers are astrologers amazing astrologers i mean really truly and you're one of them and then the then there's amazing people from other disciplines and you know scholars and healers and all coming together with this this joint collective purpose of healing our relationship to gender and sexuality and i'm holding it this year in a way that i'm hoping will be very interactive because again i feel so strongly like i said in my work in general, but specifically with this symposium, that that we are all needed, that our voices are all needed, and um, that the healing we're trying to do on, in this world needs all of us. So I'm trying very consciously to make that possible in this symposium. What's beautiful is, and again, I think it's, it's so tied in with everything we're talking about today. I mean, part of what you really emphasize in your work and in this symposium 
is the reweaving of the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. And how do we embody that and live that within ourselves? But also, I think another aspect of our work that's very similar is an understanding of the importance of being in this healing process in an experiential way, that we can't think our way out of the crises that we're in. We need to be coming from the heart and we need to be healing in an embodied way on the earth and coming back into relationship with ourselves and each other and the life around us. But also, I think another thing we have in common that you're really weaving into this symposium is the importance of sacred circles and sacred community. To me, part of the heart of the meaning of the age of Aquarius is moving out of that kind of hierarchical, patriarchal way of being, where you have authorities and followers to coming back into that understanding, that indigenous and understanding and ancient wisdom of the power of sacred community. Yeah. Where I love that notion in um, sacred circles of the understanding that each of us carries some part of the truth that we need to share in the circle because then we're weaving together that understanding and wisdom that's larger than any one of us and that we each hold some critical piece of that that needs to be woven in the tapestry of what's unfolding. And that, I think, is part of how we can heal in community as we're moving into this Aquarian age. Exactly. And that's something I was so moved by last year is that... <clears throat> I, I I think I didn't realize how um, deeply wise and amazing the people who attended would be. I mean, I, I knew that the speakers were amazing. That's true. <laughs> but the participants, yeah. incredible beings, uh, one after another, after another, after another. And, you know, again, that is what I am holding space for it this time is I can't now I get it. People showing up to this are this is not us as the speakers having the answers. Absolutely not. We are here to hold space for that community conversation, that community uh healing that we need to need to be doing collectively. And there do need to be some of us who are grounded and do have that trauma-informed lens. I mean, for sure. That is definitely my role. I mean, I think you hold a similar role in, in the symposium, but also in general. And, and so I'm conscious of that and, I'm, and I take a great deal of responsibility for that. And at the same time, um, yeah, I, I've, <clears throat> I've made the vast majority of the symposium free and available indefinitely. And that includes a, a way to be in... Um, and a free community space and in circle space online with each other and to be able to connect, make these soul level, soul, soul community connections that feels really key and important at this moment in our, our healing of our world. So that's a big part of what I, I feel called to hold space for in this symposium, but just in general in my work. Um, yeah. I, I really feel like that's going to be key in terms of, I, I and you and I talk about this a lot, we're in such an accelerated time of healing and transformation on the planet right now. And I do think it's a critical choice point for us as humanity that we have this opportunity to make this evolutionary leap into a new consciousness, co-creating a new earth together. Or we can continue in the destructive patterns we've been in and go through a cataclysmic reset. We have a choice. But I really believe, like you're saying, Martha, that the healing will come from how we can be in sacred healing community, sacred circles with and for each other. And it's been interesting for me, having done sacred circles for over 16 years in person, 
to now beginning to work with it across the globe in these, you know, communities that form online, but ways that I feel like there is such a hunger and an openness and a readiness to be in community with each other that way, to be, I love Nell Morton's phrase, hearing each other into speech, you know, listening to each other, calling each other out into the truth of who we are so that we can then be there for and with each other and heal and transform together. Yes, exactly. And I've said this to you many times before, but what I'm noticing is that um, with my clients, <clears throat> certainly, certainly there's a role for the one-on-one work, absolutely no doubt. And more often than not, when I'm sitting with individual clients, I I get the sense over and over and over again, okay, yes, this will help them, but what will actually truly be a container for their, for what they actually are needing is the community container like a consciously held community, soul community space. And so that's what I get called into doing more and more and more and more. Um, I mean, both, again, both are important, both play a role. And there's something about this community collective healing space that is done consciously and very, very, with a ton of integrity that is crucial, that is key. Um, for where I think we're all trying to go. Yeah. And and what's beautiful in what you're describing too, is I think as we're coming back into wholeness, it is about that expansion of our consciousness, but holding it in an embodied way. I love the ancient wisdom of heaven, earth. They didn't see a split. It was heaven, earth. We're part of that unity. And I think as you're talking about what it means to be more and more in sacred community with each other, it's interesting that we're more and more discovering these other planetary bodies in space. We're in an expanded cosmic community as well. And that that is a part of this transformation that we're in is coming back into that understanding of our interconnectedness and how we each holds some unique expression of cosmic consciousness, but need to bring it back into connection and into community. Yes. We're in this together, literally. Yeah. Well, anything else you'd like to add before we stop? I mean, this has been a beautiful, rich conversation, but any other thoughts or insights you'd like to share? It feels pretty complete. I mean, I think I would just like to express gratitude to you again for what the role you've held in my own life and what you give to the world in general. I know that thousands and thousands and thousands of people feel the same way. And I just want to say that out loud. And um, yeah, I can't express that enough. So thank you. Thank you. And you know, thank you for the space that you're holding with the work that you're doing and the this particular symposium, but the way in which you have really, one of the things I really respect about you is you have followed the call of spirit to move forward in the path you've been guided in, not knowing where it would lead, not knowing how it would all unfold, but trusting. And it's been profound to watch how your work has unfolded because you dared to to follow that path with spirit. Yes, sometimes very scary, definitely. (laughs) Very confusing. (laughs) Um, But yes, it has been a miracle after miracle after miracle in little ways and big ways and yeah, I'm in awe. So, and you're, you are part of that. So again, yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. And blessings to all of you who are listening and for being part of this community, this sacred community in the ways that we can be there for and with each other. All right. Blessed be.